as you can see, uh, chapter 18, and we'll be beginning in verse 18 through 23. And let us pray. Father, through the presence and power of your Holy Spirit, we, we pray that this passage will come alive to us and you will imprint in us what we need to know today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false witness. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week we talked about living a life that God rewards. And we talked about those rewards that God provides are based on the work we do for him here on this earth. So, so God invites us, uh, we who are, are here, to uh, join him in his work at reaching out to people. Now when he invites us, it leads to a point of decision. In other words, what Jesus calls us to do is kingdom oriented. And often it runs counter to what our personal desires are. It, it upsets our status quo. So what we have to do is decide whether we will do what he has asked us to do. And what we do next reveals what we believe about God. And in so doing, adjustments are required in our lives to accomplish what God has called us to do. So you're asking, why does it require adjustments? Well, there's something that Steve brought out in that little lesson about what's on the inside, what we call our sin nature. See, we have a bent to do what we want to do. Ask any teacher or principal. There are, from day one till the end of school, kids are trying where you don't have to teach someone to do bad things, do you? We often have this because we don't put God first. The first commandment, that's what sin is, missing that first commandment of putting God first in our lives. So God presents us with a path to take and we have a decision to make. Will we follow God down that path or will we choose a path of our own? Now, I'm not, I'm not just talking about major decisions. There are minor decisions we have to make every day, aren't there? Every day we choose to act Christ-like or we choose to act out of our own self-focused nature. Well, in this encounter Jesus had with this young man, Jesus presents a path for this young man to follow. Now, the young man is eager to learn more about eternal life, and so he comes to Jesus to learn more. Now, Jesus perceives this man, believes that it is in doing something that he can gain eternal life. What must I do? So Jesus points out the commandments. Now, again, Jesus is always very astute in dealing with people. And he knows all about this man. So he, he only mentions five of the last six commandments. And he leaves out coveting, which I think he probably knew the answer to that. And he doesn't even mention the first four that deal with God. And so he names these, and the young man says, yeah, yeah, I, I've kept those since I was a boy. I wonder if Jesus chuckled when he said that. Jesus knows the problem with this person's heart, and it is his possessions. So Jesus drops the big one on him. Sell all you have give it to the poor, you will then have treasure in heaven and then follow me. 
Now, I would have loved to have seen the look on this man's face when Jesus said that. Because as the Bible tells us, he was very rich. This man now faced a big decision. If any of you have ever uh, read the Experiencing God uh, book, Henry Blackaby says that there's a, a crisis of belief. There's a moment where you have a decision, and it's a crisis of belief. Jesus was offering this young man a path to eternal life. So here's where the crisis of belief comes up for this man, because his security and his identity were wrapped up in his wealth and not God. So Jesus was asking him to make a major adjustment in his life. To do what Jesus was asking required this man to fully trust Jesus. This was a God-sized request. To give up everything he knew would require changing his whole world, his whole way of living. It would, re it would require giving up something he had treasured and most likely worked his entire life to accumulate. What he did next revealed what he believed about God. So Jesus was calling him to a different way of life. One that required total faith in God. And as we see, he chose to turn away and turn back to the life that he knew best. But here's the problem. He missed eternal life. He trusted in his wealth instead of Jesus. So here's kind of the first point. To follow Jesus will require changes in our life. It requires making changes. It will require adjustments in our lives. Now, it might be as simple as just changing our attitudes, our, our thinking, and just seeking to put God first in even the small decisions. It might require major changes. But it will require a change. Whatever God calls us to will require a change, and we have to make adjustments in our lives. Henry Blackaby goes on to say, We cannot stay where we are and go with God in obedience to His will. We cannot stay put as a Christian, because God is always calling us deeper, deeper. We cannot stay in one position. All of us make those adjustments in our lives as we grow as followers of Jesus. Every day we're, we're adjusting, we're changing as God reveals to us those things. Now here, here's probably a problem some people have. They think God is asking us to make those changes to make our lives miserable. Most people look at the Ten Commandments and all they see is a thou shalt nots. But here's the thing, the changes God asks us to make are for our ultimate good. Jesus looked at the heart of this young man and he knew exactly what was standing in the way of his eternal life. It was his wealth. His wealth was a barrier. And, and we, sitting here today, could see that he would have been free of all that. His possessions were possessing him. But in that moment, he couldn't see it. Now, again, you look at this, and the man walks away, and, and you think, I wonder if later he came back. I wonder if he started thinking about what Jesus said, and he goes, you know he's right. But we don't know that, do we? And that's not even the point. The point is for what will we do when Jesus asks us to make adjustments in our lives because he will. He will ask. So Jesus lays out the situation and the first step is the mental decision. Now that's the easy part. Jesus says, do this. And we go, yeah, I'll do that. I think Jesus even told a parable about a man who had two sons. One of them, he said, I want you to go do such and such. And, and the young man said, no. But later on, he changed his mind, and he did it. 
To the next son, he said, go do such and such. And the young son said, why, yes, I will. But he didn't do it. So Jesus said, who did the will of his father? It's the actions that we see. So we might think what, what the invitation of God will require. We have to do something in response to God's invitation. Something must happen. Our actions will reveal our faith. We can talk a good game, can't we? But when we put the rubber to the road, so to speak, when we put the pedal to the metal, that's when it really reveals our faith. Will we trust God so that we can make the adjustments required? So what are some of the adjustments that God will make? First, they might be small adjustments. That's kind of the good news, isn't it? God's not inviting all of us to go to Africa to be missionaries. But he is asking us to do something. He's asking us to make some adjustments in our lives. Most of these adjustments are incremental, step by step. But here's the thing. The sooner we make them, the sooner we can begin to experience God's richness and fullness. Now, some of these might be in our conversations. Are our conversations Christ-like? Where we're not being critical, where we're not being negative, where we're not gossiping, or as we like to call it, prayer concerns. <laughs> how we handle current things in our lives, how we view our money, being more content, letting the fruit of the Spirit show up in our lives, making adjustments in relationships, Choosing to be more focused on others' needs rather than our own. Making adjustments in how we spend our time. Choosing to read the Bible more. Choosing to pray more. Choosing to look around and see where God is at work. Making adjustments in our attitudes. Quick to forgive. Again, looking to see where God is at work seeking God in our decisions, seeking to be more intentional in our lives as Christ followers. Yes, there might be major decisions, major adjustments. It may even be a whole new career change. It may be coming out of retirement. But make no mistake, God does call us to make those adjustments because it means coming closer and closer to him for the person who's not yet a christ follower there is a major adjustment where we adjust from living for self and living for christ now here's here's what came to me this week in in thinking about adjustments what if we had someone who made adjustments for us don't we love it when somebody else adjusts their plans for us? Oh, that was so nice of you to make to do this for me. Don't we love that? So think about our greatest need. And I, again, I think Steve did it so wonderfully. Looking on the inside, what is our greatest need? We have sin to deal with. Our ultimate need is to connect or even reconnect with God. Sin has broken that connection, and we have no way of reconnecting. We can't do enough good stuff. So that's why Jesus left heaven to come to earth. Jesus made the greatest adjustment of all for us. Can you think of any greater adjustment than that? And so we're reminded of that when we celebrate Holy Communion. Thinking about why Jesus came, because we're kind of saying, and again, we have the, 
core of the apple that's gotten kind of brown and yucky looking. How do we deal with that? Can we put that skin back on the apple? Can't do it, can we? Can we, even though we, we like to think we can be nicer, we can do things, how much is enough? When, when do you know that you've accomplished the payment for what you've done? Well, the Bible takes care of that because God's plan was that he would come in person God became human and came for one purpose, to die on a cross, to pay for our sin. Because we can't, we can't make it up. We can't, we can't do enough good. But ah, Jesus makes the adjustment to come from the glory of heaven to come down to this life. For what purpose? For us. And, and the Bible says all we have to do is accept that. Just the, the simple act of putting an apple in a white sack. That was pretty simple, wasn't it? And, and when you hold, held up the white sack, could you see the apple any longer? No. You saw the white sack. When we say yes to Jesus, he takes on our ugliness, our sin. And what does he give us? His righteousness. This is what we look like to God. And all we had to do was repent and turn away and accept and all Jesus had to do was be nailed to a cross for us. And so we're reminded of that when we celebrate Holy Communion. I would, I would remind and, and let you know that in the United Methodist Church, all are welcome to take communion. Everyone is welcome John Wesley even believed a non-Christian was welcome to take communion because in that moment he had seen people become Christian just by that action. So the Lord's table is open to all who come to earnestly seek a relationship with him. So today let us draw near to God as he has drawn near to us. Jesus speaks to us as he did to his disciples in the upper room. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this meal with you. Think about that. Jesus has, has waited all week for us to come here. He has waited all week for you and I to come to this moment. He calls us now to a time of reflection, repentance, and renewal. So allow him to touch your heart and deal with whatever is there. This is a time to be reminded of God's marvelous grace. And the gift he gives to us to all who call upon his name is eternal life. Something this, this young man in our text missed. A life that begins the moment we call upon him for salvation. So let us pray together this prayer of confession. The Bible calls us to look at our lives before we come to communion. And let me just say, no one is ever perfect enough to take communion. I know over the years I've talked to people, well, I don't feel worthy. Well, let me tell you, I'm not worthy to serve it. But it's, but it's again because Christ cleanses us. And so we need from time to time to confess those things that, that make the inside brown. So I invite you to read this prayer aloud with me today. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you confessing our unworthiness. We have failed you many times, but you are so gracious that you restore us as sons and daughters. This is made possible by the shed blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We humbly acknowledge our gratitude for his act upon the cross. We call upon your Holy Spirit to work within us to bring us closer to you through the action of Jesus Christ. We owe all to him and are grateful to you. Let us now spend some quiet time praying to the Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. All of us are forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are forgiven by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and his shed blood poured out for us. Jesus gave himself up for us that he met in the upper room with his closest followers. And during the supper, he offered them bread. And he said, this bread is my body. It represents my body and what is about to happen to me for you. So he said, as often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took one of the cups during that Passover meal and he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so as often as we drink from the cup and partake of the bread, we celebrate Christ's death until he comes again in final victory. Let us pray. Father, as we offer to you ourselves, we uh, offer these simple elements to you that this bread and this juice would become for us the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and that we who partake will be changed forever. We thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. 